Hi everyone, welcome to Potluck, where we talk about cultural appropriation. Well, let's start by a by a definition. What, what what's your understanding of the term, and how would you relate it to food? So, cultural appropriation um, is a term that's been thrown about a lot the last couple of years, and um, it's a little bit for me. It's a little bit difficult to define because apart from being a sort of like broad, you know, subject, like I feel like there's lots of aspects where, you know, or there are a lot of situations and circumstances where the term could get thrown into a room, thrown into a conversation um, <clears throat> that could go like different ways, you know? Um, what, what is your understanding of cultural appropriation? Well, um... At the beginning, I, I, I wouldn't understand it. It's also a, a new term for me. And I was like, okay, so what, what's the deal with, I don't know, with, with many things that happen around this topic. But I remember one one case really it may, made me understand what, why, why it makes so many people angry. And, and this was a, like an airline uh, and uh, in a country in Southeast Asia, you know these co countries uh, where where the tattoos come from, this uh, tribal tattoos with the oh yeah yeah, yeah that have the, the their own uh, visual language and aesthetics uh, of shapes uh, and these kind of things. So the airline took this aesthetics to its corporate image, but they wouldn't hire people with those tattoos that come from that culture you know uh you know yeah, well, i mean that's shitty yeah. when you listen to a case like this and uh, you i mean it, everything makes sense because this is a, an extreme case where you know it's even you know funny but in a bad way you know that something like this happens um but then and there are other cases, like for instance, people talking about costumes or this kind of things, or or even more, like I don't know, uh, crazy examples like talking about characters in video games or in cartoons that don't represent the, the culture they portray. And I mean, if we bring it to food, I can relate because I've seen some things, uh, for instance, uh, from my Venezuelan heritage. I've seen like, like uh, recipe videos where there is someone trying, pretending to know how to cook a specific recipe. I remember uh, a specific case was a, a carne mechada. The guy was calling it carne mechada, and he <laughs> and he would put it like in a in a food processor, the meat, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> and make like oh, a, a puree out of it, you know, like, uh, of course, anybody who understands what carne mechada is, sees that and will get offended. Uh, so I understand if I take, I don't know, a few Asian ingredients and cook something and put like a, a name in it of a dish I've never tried in its original place. You know, I understand that people will hate me for that if I do that, you know? Yeah, I do understand that also. Um, like, I mean, the but that's the difficult thing. It's sort of like, um, like, when does it have to do with the, like, when is it a valid point to, like, point the finger at the culture? And um, and also, when is it adequate for you to take owner, ownership of that culture in, in that sort of way in order to put somebody else uh, and what they're doing in their place? You know, like at what point do you have the right to do that? I think with the um, with the airline, you know, that's like clear discrimination. You know, I mean, that's full on full on discrimination. Um, no, but, but for then, me, the point the point is not discrimination. For me, the point is uh, they're they're using something that belongs to to that people. You know, because it's their own yeah. aesthetic and their their own culture. And 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 then you're discriminating them at the same time, you know, like yeah, yeah, exactly. They're exploit like their marketing 
and exploiting a certain culture for their profit, you know, for with their image, but then um, they'll discriminate the people where the, that is actually coming from, what they are benefiting from, right? Um, without giving anything back. I, I have another example. I was uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, like six weeks ago, uh, in Boston and New York, and we went to a few Italian American restaurants, you know, and yeah. being there, I mean, for for me, Italian American is its own thing, and uh, I the the people I I work with uh, are all from Europe, and they they've been to Italy and Italian restaurants uh, like for decades, and wh when I told them, yeah, this is an Italian American restaurant, they were like, what? Okay, well, okay, Italian American because. This has nothing to do with Italy, like at all. Like the portions, the the way the, the the sequence, what comes first, what comes after, you know. And so you could say that this maybe it's not cultural appropriation because it's heritage uh, uh, of generations ago that, that that some Italian heritage and it evolves into its own thing, but it has nothing to do with the source anymore. So. Maybe it's a different topic, uh, not cultural appropriation, but something else, bastardization uh, of a culture or a tradition. And, and mm. you get to see that, for instance, like with the so controversial uh, American paella, where you add chorizo to the paella, and this is highly offensive for paella Nazis in Valencia. Uh, <laughs> so... I mean, um, this thing that, that there are no rules like and and stuff like uh, food or music, you know, like you just listen to a rhythm or to a, a a specific flavor profile and you just replicate it, you know, like yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, but but uh, this like this brings up like one of the like most important points I think in this like topic. I mean. You know, with the two examples that you just talked about, you know, Italian American, I would totally agree. It's like something completely different. But um, those were Italians coming to America and uh, like adapting and uh, to the food culture there, and then it evolved. You know, so nobody took anything from anybody. You know, this is something that was created by immigrants, and then it evolved into a new sort of like cultural identity of immigrants living in a new country. And I think this is one of the main things because, you know, we're talking about food, you know, which, as you just said, you know, make examples of sort of like music and art and all those sorts of things um, where this is not a stiff thing. This is something, this is a cultural identity, which especially nowadays, you know, mixes and merges and evolves so much um i mean from the time where people like you know in the italian american example you know from when people immigrated to from italy to america you know and then imagine like nowadays where we have so many inputs from every corner of the world constantly you know and um but you know americans taking paella and you know making it something else you know that's that's not a people for, uh, that's not a person from Valencia doing that, you know, that's Americans doing it very, very like ignorantly, uh, whether that's good or bad, like that's, that's a different topic, but it's, it comes from a place of not knowing what they're doing, you know? So, and then to call it a certain name, I think that is, that is where the issue lies for some people, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen pictures of, uh paellas like like really fake and using lime instead of lemon uh i mean uh and th there is also a thing like being america as, as a whole continent i'm talking about from canada to argentina uh, uh a continent that was colonized so the the original cultures were completely transformed into something else i think the whole continent is much more permissive uh, with mixtures and actually you will see fusion restaurants uh, as something nice and interesting and if you go to New York you will see a lot of uh, you could find like a Greek 
Thai uh, fusion restaurant, just to say an example, and people will find this interesting, while in Europe, it's the opposite. It's like, uh, well, what the fuck is that? You know, like, I want, like, something that I can get, like, a, a frame of understanding of, of what I, I'm, I'm going to eat. Um, yeah. I had another idea, but I forgot about it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, sort of like, so So that's the thing, like we have, I mean, we now we spoke about two, like very, um, very clearly marked examples. We spoke about one example where the immigrants adapt to a new culture and like a new basically subculture, um, you know, uh, is, is created, is formed. Italian-Americans, basically exactly the same, like um, the Nikkei food culture, right? It's exactly the same. Immigrants, yeah. Japanese it, it, immigrants going into Peru, adapting to what they have, adapting to the local taste, to the ingredients, and a new thing is formed, you know? And um, it's a, its own thing. It's a new thing, and it's a exactly. different thing. And I can imagine, exactly. a, like, uh, a Japanese seeing the way Nikkei chefs do some things and they wouldn't agree or would think that's not the way you do it or whatever, but that's the way you do it in Nikkei cuisine. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but then like, and then we talked about, you know, um, you know, chorizo pie, yeah, which, uh, you know, is people just doing whatever they feel like, you know, with sort of thinking that they know how it's done, but actually not knowing how it's done. But then there's a lot of gray area in between, you know, where the argument of sort of like, you know, blaming somebody for uh, culturally appropriating something, it's a little bit more difficult, I think. Um, I can think of one very good example. But for which, example, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I can think of one really good example uh, that happened a couple of years ago. There was a, a very, very popular Uh, restaurant in London uh, that was cooking traditional northern Thai food and it's not owned by a Thai person uh, and the food is primarily cooked by uh, not by Thai people but the, the head chef and co-owner um, he's a guy from the UK uh, he spent a lot of time in Thailand and basically spent mo well spent most of his career cooking northern Thai food going to Thailand, researching it, um, and then, you know, um, going back and cooking these dishes, obviously putting his own twist on it, but without making them fusion-y or anything. Um, and anyway, had great success. Uh, started as a small sort of like pop-up, long-running pop-up, and then he opened a very big restaurant. Um, And uh, the claim of them culturally appropriating came up because one of his chefs who had been with him for many, many years had a YouTube channel that was, you know, a little bit offensive to a lot of people because he was making uh, cooking videos on how to cook certain Thai dishes, um, but he was making some inappropriate comments about, the, about Thai culture. He was speaking in an accent sometimes. Um, and so people got wind of that and then related him to the restaurant because like I said, he had been working there for, for six years or something at least, um, in the end, getting him fired with a lot of, you know, Asian people speaking out against this restaurant saying, fire this guy, you owe it to my culture, um, because you are, um, you are making a profit of a culture that's not yours. And... I, I guess that's the yeah. claim. That's the claim of cultural appropriation. But I don't know. Like, uh, I feel I could, if I wanted, uh, open an Italian restaurant and cook Italian. <laughs> like, I, I feel it's my right. You know, like uh, maybe because it's Italian, because it's something so rooted into the old Western culture. But perhaps if I were to open like a Nepalese restaurant without ever being there in my life, and uh, I understand it actually, you know, like. But where where, where would you set the line? That that's the problem. Yeah, that is the problem. I think. I mean, I I have a very like unpopular opinion about all of this. That um, I think it's kind of like freedom of speech, you know. It's yeah. like just let just let the people cook whatever they want. 
Um, yeah. You know, if you if you go there and you eat it and you say, this is not a paella, there's chorizo in it, you know, don't go back to the restaurant. That's it. But let the guy cook whatever they want. Right. It's like, I don't understand at what point somebody feels entitled um, to have the right of censoring somebody's actions, somebody's words, somebody's cooking, right? Um, because they feel like they have an ownership over the content of what they're producing. Well, what I, I know and I understand from intellectual property and patents and all these kind of things uh, is that you can't patent uh, something that, that is a, a knowledge to be a tradition. So you can't go like into the Amazonas and find like a, a technology that, for instance, a, a, a shaman has and and patent it and steal it. And if someone proves that was uh, that they were doing this uh, before you, then your patent is not not uh, it doesn't qualify for it. Um, so I guess the same thing applies to culture, you know, like and food, like. I mean, I really like cooking what I call like free Asian cooking. I just go to an Asian supermarket and get a lot of different stuff and and combine them uh, with my culinary understanding. And there's nothing wrong about it. And I could open a, a I understand if I open a restaurant and I say that's traditional something well, well, when it's not, that's a problem. But if I say yeah. this is whatever, uh, my freestyle Asian bar, nobody can say anything against it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's sort of like, it's your right, you know, it's your right to express yourself. And um, especially because, you know, again, kind of going back to the fact that we're talking about food, you know, like food is something that's so merged and so sort of like, it's kind of like if you, if you want to send to something saying, oh, this is originally from here. It's like, where do you draw the line? Do we uh, um, count out everything containing cinnamon in like European cooking, you know, like uh, arroz con leche, like rice pudding? Is that suddenly not Spanish anymore? You know, like, I mean, so much of, for example, Spanish food culture is so extremely influenced by Arab food culture. Does that mean that it's not Spanish anymore? Not at all. Spanish uh, food, what it is today, is a product of exactly that. Yeah, the, the other thing that comes to my mind is like, but again, this is also like a, a consequence of colonization uh, in the Americas. Uh, and it's that, that there were things that have names that don't really correspond with the object they're naming. I remember in the Amazonas, there were fishes that were called sardines. There were also like, like more on a cultural level, there, there were myths uh, that really ring the bell to the Bible, and they they were telling them as if they were indigenous uh, myths, uh, and it's like no, somebody told you that at some point ago, and you're just repeating like something that is in the Bible. This is not uh, something from here, you know. And and of course, because these uh, cultures were completely exterminated and and indoctrinated into Christianism and and Western values. So uh, it yeah. makes sense that they call sardines to some Amazonian fish or uh, beer to some traditional Amazonian drink, you know? You know, that's so extremely funny to me, actually, because I can just imagine, like, Spanish guys walking through the Amazonas and being like, oh, have you seen this weird fish? And it's like, ah, it's a sardina. <laughs> <laughs> It's like really, and that's probably what happened, you know. Like, and also, like, that there are problems with this um, cultural colonization. Uh, I read a, a study on, on, you know, in the Andes. If you if you go through the Andes, you will see there are uh, cheese. It's really important. You see cheese in every culture. That they, they they have this fresh cheeses, and everybody eats cheese. But it turns out. Like a lot of people are not lacto tolerant because this is not something rooted there. This is something. This is an absolute uh, implementation of colonizers. So the, the, there's a lot of people producing and eating cheese, even though it's not the best thing for their diet. You know. Oh really? 
That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. But I mean, like there again, it's sort of like it's in that gray area because it's like if it's a product of colonization, you know, it's like there, it's, there could it's be not, a value. It's not appropriation. It's colonization. It's a different yeah issue. Yeah, but if people if people are like rejecting it and saying this is not part of like my but yeah, you're right. We're we're, we're kind of uh, sliding into a different subject here. Yeah, because um, uh, yeah, here it's also a cultural victimization from or or domination from gram, gram, one group over another, but uh, through a complete different dynamic. Yeah, Te Tex-Mex would be another example. Imagine like like a, yeah. you know, like, like a Texan guy making a, like a super food chain of Mexican food. <laughs> and you know, and he's he's actually taking uh, Mexican traditions, bastardizing it, creating new things. Like I, I know that burritos is something that doesn't exist in Mexico. You know, it's, it's something American. I mean, uh, like from the United States. Uh, and that there, are, especially in the United States, also because it was a country that where where many um restaurants from other cultures started like probably the first japanese restaurants outside of of asia or japan were in the united states before they spread it uh, to other countries and also ch chinese restaurants uh, and all of these for instance a chop sway and many other uh, chinese recipes are and this is again something different but these are adaptations from chinese for the American public. So they're not cooking yes. their traditional recipes, they're creating something new so that the uh, the locals accept it. Yeah, totally. But like, if, you know, like where's the problem in that? You know, not at all. I also don't think, you know, I find myself, and this is a really interesting thing to realize about yourself, is I find myself being more swayed to dislike the, the American guy making Mexican food than I am like for, somebody you know else to start cooking asian food because somehow uh, i can sort of uh, how would you say it like i can i can paint like the evil picture more of like the, <laughs> the, the, the texan the texan evil businessman that's, yeah that's, exactly you know. but, but imagine, imagine that the guy is racist against mexicans but you know but he has like his, his restaurant chain with mexican food i mean yeah I think the, the, the conclusion about this topic is that it will always depend on context. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, like, like you can just ha have fun and do uh, and mix different cultures in your pot. Or uh, I think the problem comes uh, if you label it some way uh, and if you, if you have some claims uh, about it. You know, the, if it's actually something fake, because you, yeah. if you're mixing stuff and having fun with it and you say that's what you're doing, that's not fake. But if you say, yeah, this is a traditional Korean recipe from the 1600s, okay, then you're just, you know. And it's fraud. It's fraud, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or you're taking something. Uh, I really don't know where the line is, actually. I guess I if think you, you summed it up I, I really well, actually. Yeah. If you're doing something from a culture, let's say uh, a Mexican restaurant, you should be open and grateful with Mexicans. You know, just for having uh, a Mexican restaurant. Uh, or the case with the airline, or the case uh, with, the, uh, with the tide you mentioned. I mean, uh, it's something that, that has to be part of your understanding of what you're doing. Yeah, I think I think what you're talking about is kind of an appreciation, you know, like if you um, if you do something because you appreciate the culture as a completely different thing than if you're doing something to um, leverage somebody else's work, culture, identity, just for a monetary reason, you know, I mean, sort of like, like, how many People, would you mean like you know? I mean, I actually I spent some years cooking Thai food, and like the Thai people that I met at events and stuff, they were always super happy and super excited for a white guy to be cooking Isan Northern Thai food, which is not a very well-known food. 
um, you know, because also, you know, internationally, it's not what people imagine Thai food is. Um, you know, likewise, if I would, you know, like if I look at Japan and their obsession with, you know, German like beer houses, you know, I don't feel like anybody's culturally appropriating anything. Obviously, it's always it's always much more dramatic, like the other way around. If white people are culturally appropriating minorities, you know, in, of course, in, yeah, in quotation marks. But like, if I like, I would never feel any resentment to anybody, you know, anywhere in the world, putting on a pair of lederhosen and um, and making roasted pork knuckle, right? And I feel like that's also is what happening, you know. Like, I mean, how many? And again, it's sort of like the cultures merge. Like Mexicans uh, in the south, you know, uh, of the states, um, cooking Tex-Mex food themselves, you know, making burritos and stuff like that. And it's not sort of like, oh, we're just doing this because uh, because the um, the white guys like it. No, they're just doing it because it was kind of part of the region there. And like, why not make it good, you know? And why not embrace the the melting pot of the two cultures? No, no, no. Yeah, it's like a döner. It's like a döner, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. it's more some. It's more uh, German. It's German Turkish. It's not Turkish Turkish. Yeah, it's not Turkish at all. I mean, it was invented in Germany, no? But uh, but it's it's just a. I mean, Germany for me is a very good example of like two cultures melting and like enriching a place, you know? Because I mean, I personally I can't imagine Germany without the cultural influence of of the Turkish population in Germany, you know? Not at like all. For me, it's made, it's made Germany into, like, um, yeah, and Turkish and obviously Italian also, you know, but, like, primarily Turkish. Um, it's made it in, into a new culture for me. It's kind of taken one step further. What about uh, these chefs like David Munoz or Tim Rauer, who, like... I, for me, it would be silly to accuse them or uh, what's the name of this guy, Dos Palillos, uh, Albert Raurich. For me, it wouldn't be yeah. fair to accuse these guys from cultural appropriation. This, this would be yeah. like, these guys are also not claiming that they're doing anything traditional. So you see the difference. Yeah. It would be yeah. ridiculous. Being inspired. It would be ridiculous if you would listen to Tim Rauer saying like, yeah, this is a way, uh, like in a traditional monastery in China, this is prepared, like, come on, no. You're just... Maybe uh, does say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're just having fun and creating whatever you want. Same way with, in the three examples, you know? They, they yeah. get inspired, they are also adapted to the local market, and they also use their culinary knowledge with, with uh, other traditions and other ways of understanding what a sauce is or what a marinade is, you know? Yeah, definitely. And again, I think they're just, they're just, you know, they're creating from a, from a point of appreciation and admiration for those cultures, you know, they, they're excited about it, you know, and they're, you know, they eat something and it inspires them and they take it back. I mean, that's kind of what creativity is about, no? Um, and I mean, that's the cool thing about the era that we live in also that you have so many inputs that, you know, you take in and you take with you and you carry with you. And that is reflected in the work that you do, whether it's cooking or music or whatever. And I mean, I've worked in this kind of restaurants, restaurants that, that have these kinds of concepts. And it was common to see a lot of Asian people coming to the restaurant. So that this, mm. they, they weren't obviously not offended at all if, if they're coming to eat to, to the place you know it really that really reminds me of i don't know if you've seen this video of this guy in in the states dressing in this like really silly like mexican outfit like big sombrero and poncho <laughs> and he goes to like a college campus and um, asks students like if his outfit offends them by the way none of the students mexican and they're all super offended they're sort of like you don't understand what this means, what the, me the meaning that it has, what you're wearing, blah, blah. And then he goes to like a Mexican neighborhood <laughs> and talks to the guys and they're all super excited. They're like, hey, you look amazing, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's really, really funny. Yeah, yeah, I saw, I saw the video. 
I also showed that video to a, a, a friend of mine who is a, kind of like a defender of, of this issue, like of cultural appropriation. And he he laughed about it, but he told me, well, this doesn't solve the problem. You know, there is a problem and and this is just, yeah, I mean, uh, I also understand like the airline example or some of the example we named that there is obviously a problem and, and an appropriation of, of a culture. But in other cases, uh, there's just not, and nobody's being harmed or, or oppressed or taking advantage of by some acts, you know, like just having a yeah, costume. And it does, yeah, and it doesn't come from a place of hate. It's not sort of like you pulling your eyes to sort of like mimic like Asian eyes or something, which comes more from a like a, um, a ridicule and like more of like a hateful sort of like sentiment. Yeah. Like, you know, like it, it has a negative connotation to it. And I feel like this is the main thing. Like this is the main difference between all these examples that we're talking about. It's like, if you want to use something or like you want to uh, represent something with a negative feeling, you know, I feel like then you are, um, you know, you, you're doing something wrong very clearly. But I think if, you, if you're doing something, you know, um, in appreciation, if you have appreciation for something, you wouldn't ridicule it, you know, you would take aspects of that culture and, you know, um, and take them in and, and process them in your own way. I also uh, understand if someone, like, let's say, a Kaiseki chef from Kyoto, uh, go to one of these places uh, like the, the Tim Raue or uh, Raurich or David Munoz and they don't get it, don't appreciate it and don't find it exciting and and even, you know, have their strong opinions about it. And yeah, of course, I would totally get it. I mean, like something like that happened actually at uh, one of the Berlinale, um, the film festival in in Berlin, where um, Jiro Ono, the famous sushi chef from Tokyo, came for um, the showing of the documentary about him, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Um, and uh, the, <laughs> the organizers had the brilliant idea to have, um, you know, not to name any names, but maybe too late, um, a very famous <laughs> German, <laughs> a very famous German chef who cooks like fine dining food with Asian influences cater for this man. Because obviously it's just logical that if one person is Asian, that he'll enjoy any sort of Asian food, no matter where it comes from. You know, I think that's ridiculous. Obviously this guy from a super traditional place that lives in a very, very, you know, like the things that he eats, the things that he sees, the things that he deals with, they, they come from a super traditional um place anybody who's watched a movie or who's read anything about this man uh, knows this anybody who's been to japan knows how much how, how much people especially of this age group are involved in these like traditions working in this profession and then to just kind of think that the right like he would enjoy um this like very modern asian fusion food just because it's under the same label of asian in general that's uh that's completely bonkers to me and obviously like he didn't touch any of the food um which you know caused a bit of an upset which is why i heard about the story you know that that actually happens a lot that uh some let's say you i was living in bolivia and i went to denmark to copenhagen and my host ha had the brilliant idea oh of course let's bring him to a latin american restaurant he'll love it and i was like <laughs> <laughs> the food capital, you know. I come from Latin America, and I think the best idea would be to try anything else, you know. <laughs> anything, yeah, anything that's not Latin American, of course. <laughs> and and I mean, it won't be like a one-to-one -one representation. It's impossible. You're in a completely different place of the world, so with a completely different context. So it's going to be like a bad copy of the original. Well, why, why would you, you know, offer that? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I would always think the complete opposite, you know, 
Cool. Do you have a kind of finishing statement or something? No. <laughs> so if you're watching this at home uh, and you have some preoccupations about cooker appropriations while you're cooking, uh, our recommendation is to just do whatever the fuck you want. As, yeah, do whatever you want as long as you're respectful and as long as it comes from a place of appreciation and love. Um, but apart from that, just do and cook whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, I agree. See you next time. See you next time where we talk about pizza.